Hello, subscribers. Hello, others. It's David Hoffman again, filmmaker. And I'm about to show you another clip from 1979, which seems to be very popular with many of my subscribers. Another clip from this same movie that I made back then, The Information Society, primetime public television, looking at the coming of the information age. So go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is a typical beautiful town that has the coming of the information age in the banks, uh, in the airport, in the hotels, and still the old timers, the farmers, the farmers that had lived there for hundreds of years. So I got old people and I got young people and I made this television special, which is just terrific. The Information Society, primetime PBS, looking at that moment, 1979, and I throw away everything I didn't use. The film is the film. Why do I throw it away, you ask yourself? Dumb is what I say. I just didn't see the value since I was carrying 39,000 pounds of stuff with me when I moved between one house and another, and I was moving fairly regularly during that time in my life, I didn't see carrying old 16 millimeter work picture, which is all scratched up and filled with splices, and work sound, which is filled with punch holes and other stuff like that. So I threw it out. Now I'm on YouTube, several years ago, and I'm looking for material that you, my subscribers, would like to see. And I know you like 1979, this old stuff that I filmed on Wall Street and uh, with the old lady who was 98 in 1979. And so I go looking in my basement and I find these rolls of outtakes, not the intakes, all the good stuff, but the outtakes, all the stuff I didn't want. 16 millimeter work print filled with holes and scratches, 16 millimeter sound filled with beeps and other stuff. And I copy it. You're about to see an old couple who talk about the old days and it's almost as good as the 90 year old lady. It's just fascinating. Walt, the man of the couple, is negative towards everything. I can still remember the interview. There isn't a thing about the modern day he liked. Everything about the old days he liked. Kind of sounds like some of my commentators. Um, in any case, take a look at these old people. I think you'll find them interesting and please be tolerant of the fact this is not my interview style. These are the outtakes from my interview. Right oh, you can look at camera. the camera. Yeah, you drive that with me. Camera, camera, camera roll 20, sound 20. Why don't you start, Jenny, by uh, telling me what Lancaster was like, Lancaster, rather, when you were a kid. Well, what changes? What was it like then, and what's it, well, how does it change? The, the, the most I remember when I was a child, I only knew what happened around our own home because I never got farther than a few miles from home at that time. And you traveled by horse and buggy or carriage or else you rode a horse. And uh, then my father was one of the first people around there to get a car. He got a car for, first, it was a, uh, an old truck. Well, it wasn't old, but I mean, it would be old now. It had these big wheels with solid tires. And on a Sunday, we took out, we put benches in and sat on and went to church that way. And weekdays, he took out the benches and loaded it up for market. He attended market in Reading and took the produce to market, which he grew. I didn't do much work on the farm. I worked in the house. How did you get the information then? And if one person on the line talked to somebody else, or well, everybody else on that line would also find out. In those days, it, it was different to be in a small oh, town. Yes. What is the difference then and now? Well, because I, I never lived in a town. We lived out on the farm, and uh, when we wanted to do shopping, then we had to go to the city, of course. But that was a day's trip. You took, took one day to drive to the city and do your shopping, and you didn't go very often. Once a year on a shopping trip, and uh, for groceries, my father would get the things at a wholesale place. He'd get one case of shredded wheat, one case of cornflakes, and one case of grape nuts. <laughs> then we alternated. Well, do you think, is the, wall, is the world a smaller place? Uh, that's hard to define. It has a lot of good points, but it has its drawbacks, like everything else. We uh, have tourism in this county now, as you know, tremendous influx of tourists and we thought in the beginning that was a wonderful thing you know it stimulated business but now it's becoming all full of hot dog stands and everything else and trash along the road and you wish they weren't here sometimes you wish it was back in the natural state when we first came here but isn't it true also that don't you feel that that let's say when your father was working as a young man in the iron in iron business 
It was a goddamn tough life. I mean, a really hard life. Haven't things gotten easier? Yes, all? yes, it has, but it has made us softer, too. We had a challenge then, and we accepted it, and we took it, and we, uh, we enjoyed ourselves in it, and that's what I like, if you have a challenge. If you have it too easy, that's what's going, happening to our nation now. We have things just given to us. If we feel we can't, don't want to work, well, the government will take care of us. Those days, we didn't. What about the speed of things? Tell me about that. I want this in for both of you. I think things are going faster and faster and faster, and it's harder for all of us, me and you. Our mental, mental institutions are being crowded because of the great stress put upon us. Now, we had stresses in the early days, I admit that. If you had some hostile Indians, <laughs> it wasn't very comfortable, but we met the challenge, and, and uh, same as the pilgrims did when they came over. They, they didn't have anything to eat, but they did the best they could. They didn't have any social security. They didn't have any do-gooders to take care of them. What about Abraham Lincoln? If they'd have had a do-gooder to take care of him, we'd have never heard of him. But what about today, in terms of the stresses? What, what about, what's good about all this information change? I mean, the fact that there's all this stuff the fact that you can see the world, and you have seen a large part of the world, the fact that there's telecommunications, the fact of all this stuff, what's good about it? How has it improved life for all of us, in your opinion? Well, it's made life easier in a certain sense, but it, it doesn't give us the challenge anymore that we had. Although, it, it depends how you look at it. You can look at it as a challenge, no matter how the stressing the moments are, but it, it, it doesn't have that... That's something that we had in the beginning that made us strong. When a nation starts, they're strong because they have to. I found that out when I visited Owen Israel. Uh, the, uh, a few million uh, Jewish people, Israelis, they knew they had to go ahead and do things to make a living and get a foothold. Well, the Arabs, they didn't care because they'd been there. They figured just life would just go on like that. Well, I was thinking of, you know, if you got sick and you needed a doctor, well, in those days, you had to take your horse and your buggy and go after the doctor. Now you just call him on the telephone or get, you know, run well, to the hospital. He doesn't come. He, they just sent an ambulance from the hospital, charge you money, you know. What has that change done for us, the fact that most of us are now not on the farm and most of us are now not in the factory? Isn't the well, problem? one thing, it's put a lot of cost on, on the food. Because, you know, there isn't as much food raised anymore because people aren't on the farm. Now that we pay the prices, when you go to the supermarket, you pay a high price for, the, for what food. What do you think about that? Uh, well, see, in the early, before my time yet, the farm was self-sufficient. They raised everything, they spun their own clothes. Now, in my generation, we were pretty near self-sufficient, but we didn't spin our own clothes anymore. But we had our chickens, we had our pigs, we had killed a beef every year, and... Uh, had a cow for milk. Yeah, a cow for milk, and make butter. cheese, all different kind of cheeses, and you were almost self-sufficient, but not quite. We didn't spin our clothes, although in those days the uh, feed company uh, s s sent their feed in Florida, called it bags, so my wife would make dresses for the girls. All our three girls went yeah. through school in what we call feed, feed, bags. feed bags. But they were beautiful Florida feed bags, but she was skilled at sewing, so she could do that, you well, know. We, you needed more today than you did in those days. You were more isolated. You didn't have the, all the people around you you do today and get in contact with them. You, as a family on the farm, you were practically isolated. Was that all good or did that have bad too? I, I wouldn't just know more than I'd want to give up my electric stove to go back to a cook stove. The way I had in the kitchen for many years, cooked with a cook stove, made my meals with wood and coal. And now I have the electric stove, I wouldn't think of going back. So naturally things are better today than they were in those days. But for that time, we had a good life. But it was fun, it was the, the challenge was great. But the challenge is great today too. If you can make a success when everybody says you can't, well, that's a challenge. And that I think is a good thing for any young person to... What's it doing? Wait a minute, cut. It's playing cut for... ...to get news. Uh, any. Uh, state news or country news, you waited days to get it. You didn't, you know, you did. Sometimes you waited a week before you, before you knew a war was over. Sometimes that was good. <laughs> if you didn't want to know about a bad thing, for instance, if you wouldn't have known about Three Mile Island within a week or two, it would have been wonderful, you know. 
But uh, nights, everything within an hour, you'd, you'd know all about it, so... That gives you, in a sense, that makes you not more educated, but smarter. You can find out within a few moments' time. In fact, if you can afford it, you can have an electronic device in your home and give you the stock report on the minute, all the time. And, uh, but whether it'll be good for you, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think you should know too much too fast. Because you think this keep your mind in a whirl. Just you take think it this easy. Information society. You think this what's called the information society is uh, not such a hard thing then. For well, in a way, but uh, not to go all out in it. Relax and enjoy your. Let your soul catch up with your body. You know, every now and then. But I was going to say it depends on your own mm. opinion about it. If you let yeah. it concern you, yeah, that, that you worry, then it's better you wouldn't have it. But if you want it just the as whole, a matter of information. The whole thing is life. In life, it's just what, how you consider things, your mental attitude toward it. If you, if you take it as a challenge, it's a wonderful thing. Mm. Just like going to market, like Bob just now, and like I did for many years, get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, go down 50 miles and load. Well, that's a dog's life to some people. To me, it was a challenge, and I enjoyed it. Mm. Uh, more technology is creeping in beside tourism. Tourism is what brought them in because of our plain people here. And, uh, but now it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's all together changing. The, uh, the countryside is changing, the landscape and everything. The thing that the tourists are coming to see is gradually changing to a tourist community, which is not good. So it's, it, but it's hard to keep the balance here. It, it's just it's hard to define. Well, I tell you, I like to get my hands into the dirt, you know, and uh, as I told you, I did office work for many years, and it was like a concentration camp to me. And I, I had no money to go out and buy a farm, and so her father was getting old, and he quit farming, and all her brothers quit too, and so finally he left me start. But he didn't think a city slicker like me could make a success of it. He was rather reluctant, but my mother-in-law, she stuck with me. And then after I started, things went all right, so he did too then. So I had the best mother-in-law that a person could ever have. I really did. She really helped me out, and we had a lot of experiences, you know. I remember yet used to have an old mule, and he was, he had uh, an IQ of pretty high, I think, because as soon as my wife rang the dinner bell, he'd stop cultivating anything he was doing for me, and he'd want to go into the barn to get his coffee break, you know, so I had to quit. Doesn't yeah. sound that way. Well, you're another generation, see, and we look back to what we thought were the good old days, but yet we wouldn't want to go back to them. <laughs> we like these, too. So we're thankful and glad we could the good so, so he got to farm because I lived on a farm, but I didn't want to live on a farm. Uh, I, I went to, to school and I was a school teacher. Yeah, she taught but after you quit high I, school. She what taught school before I was when you were a kid. Nothing. But I, I didn't like to go out and get all dirty. And, and one thing I hated was milking cows. I had to get up before I went to school and milk one or two cows every morning. And one time, one kicked real bad and it scared me that I said I didn't want to milk. So when he talked about a farm, I said, well, you've got to promise me that I don't have to milk. So that was the only stipulation. Okay, he promised, and he always kept his promise. I never needed to milk. I, but I, I like to work in the garden. I learned to like that. I, I didn't, as a girl, I didn't work out. My mother needed me in the house with six brothers. They could do the outside work. I worked in the house. But then uh, as when we were married, I started growing flowers, and I found I enjoyed it. It was therapeutic then she value. she started to making these cookies, too, and she's known all over the countryside for famous decorated cookies. Do you think that, that, that the fact that you've been to all these places in the world and you have opinions about the world has benefits, too, the fact that we all know more about each other now? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it gives you perspective. You, it enlarges your vision, you know, of things and how people live. We have no idea how the other half of the world lives until we're there. I was in a Maasai village where no white man would ever get in because of some missionary who gave them corn when they were starving and he got me in. A little bit of huts. Well, you have no idea what that's like. You know what a lot of people... I know I've seen pictures in South America. I've been with the wild Indians without any clothes in the Amazon and things like that. They live just as primitive as possible. It's all right to them, I guess, but they have a haunting fear of their welfare. and tribes come in and raid them and steal their women and things like that. And it, it, it's a hard life for them too, you know. Let's talk about technology for a minute. 
technology in the farm. When you were a youngster, there was a lot of technology on the farm that wasn't there a hundred years before that. What about technology? Well, you have to have it because of the increase in the population. We have all these uh, people who feel we shouldn't have this and the air should be clean, which is a good thing, but you can't have it. With an increased population, you have to use chemicals to accelerate the growth of the plants. You have to have some kind of insecticides and herbicides and all these things, although you have to use them judiciously. But you can't, you can't produce enough to feed the world in the way we did it a hundred years ago. It's impossible. So we have to use the transition over to the things that we have to do now. And that's where we have the challenge now, to meet that thing in a way that's acceptable to our health and to our well-being. We can have clean air, but if you don't have enough to eat, it don't help you much, you'll die anyway. Let me ask you one more question about that. Right now, today, this looks like the farm, the center of the farm, but in fact it's not because you read the Wall Street Journal. I'm sure Bob reads a lot of pro publications that has to do with the price of things. Nature well, we, ha we have to know in order to plan our next year's affairs and everything else, we have to know how the thing is going. Supposing a certain <clears throat> crop is way overproduced, why, why produce it that year? Produce something else in its place. Then when everybody else quits producing that because of overproduction, you jump in when they're out. Everything has its cycles. Everything in life has its ups and downs, ups and downs. You have to study them. And after a while, you'll get in the rhythm of things. Then you apply yourself to the rhythm. So you have to use your what little you have inside of your head to, to good advantage, you know.